seems like kind of hard to manage, you know, multiple roommates in a room. How, do, how does that work for you doing that remotely versus like, an, you know, everyone thinks about like just renting a single family as a single family. Before house hacking was a thing, we kind of just had this just as, you know, a bunch of friends living together. Right. But doing it remotely is actually much less work and much less headache than actually dealing with it here. So mm. I have a single family in Hillsboro. Uh, and that's about an hour drive versus going to Seattle. It's about two and a half, three hours. And I'm way more inclined to go to Hillsboro and fix something than I am just to simply call a contractor or a plumber and just get it taken care of right then and there. Especially now, you know, when the cash flow is really, really nice, I don't have to deal with going up there. Kind of the system I have behind that is I have one house lead, usually he's in the master or whatever. And then um, I'll kind of pre-screen the tenant. And if they're qualified with a credit and background check, I'll give it to them to set up an appointment. And then they kind of gave me the thumbs up or thumbs down whether or not they're a good candidate for the home. Okay. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 46 of the Realize Gains podcast. I'm your co-host Jordan Lee, a mortgage lender based here in Portland, Oregon, NMLS 1440237. Uh, I'm licensed in about nine states and I invest in single family residences. And I'm your co-host Stephen Tran. I'm an Oregon and Washington realtor and I invest in multifamily and short-term rentals. And today uh, we interviewed my good friend Joe Tran. Yeah, super, super interesting interview. You definitely got to tune into it. He does a great job of talking about uh, the original, the OG house hacking, as well as um, working in real estate part-time to start. Yeah, and it's funny. I've known Joe since I was 18 years old. I was actually one of his first tenants in his house in Seattle. And mm. you know, he's definitely built out a great portfolio of single-family homes uh, where he's rented you know, each one rent, uh, room by the room. And also, we actually share a fourplex together. Yeah, this, the, when they talk about their partnership, that's also a, a great thing to tune into. Um, it, it'll kind of help you learn, understand how to, to kind of segregate the work and kind of work together on a project. So yeah, if you're interested in house hacking, if you're interested in do, making real estate your side gig become your main gig, or if you're interested in partnership, this is a good episode for you. Hey guys, welcome to the Realize Gains podcast. I'm Stephen Tran. And I'm your co-host Jordan Lee, and we're super excited to have Joe Tran on the show today. Joe, do you mind just like giving us a quick intro about you know, like, are you from Portland or how, how did you get here and kind of your story of how, where you went in your career and how you got interested in real estate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is really cool to actually be here. So thanks for having me on the show, Stephen and Jordan. <laughs> We've had uh, quite a roster of people that I've, uh, you know, been really close friends with and looked up to. And it's kind of like, huh, I wonder if they're ever going to call me on the show. But actually, I've been actually pretty busy running around myself. But uh, uh, so a little bit about myself. Um, I graduated from Washington State University uh, School of Pharmacy in 2013. Go Kooks. Uh, I spent my <laughs> undergrad at uh, the University of Washington from 04 to 09 with a cellular molecular uh, biology degree. And then um, I settled in Vancouver because it's actually where I was uh, born and raised. My parents uh, came over to the States in 1985. They're actually refugees from uh, the Vietnam War by boat and um, been growing up here ever since. So. Yeah, finished pharmacy school at 26, um, bought my house at 27, and been a pharmacist for about 10 years, and then I decided to take a leap of faith, and uh, beginning uh, 1 one twenty three of this year, I decided to uh, uh, segue myself out of pharmacy and uh, transition to full-time real estate, and it's actually been a really awesome adventure so far. Oh, wow. Quick synopsis. Well, first of all, Joe, I actually asked you to be on the show a few times before you said <laughs> before you said yes. So nice try there. But, uh, but, uh, True story. T tell me about, like, you, you said right after pharmacy school, you, you bought a home. Um, you bought it as a primary, I'm assuming. How, what was your thought process on that? Like, how, did you save up for a down payment? Or, and how did you get, like, how did you figure that part out? Yeah, so this story is pretty cool. So when uh, I started uh, at in Seattle, University of Washington, uh, 18 years old, my parents were thinking, okay, well, you're going to spend four years of your undergrad here, and then you're going to spend your next four years getting your doctorate, doctorate here as well. So instead of spending all this money on apartments and you know dorms and all that type of stuff, let's find a house. So they took pretty much everything they had, and we bought a house in Seattle. Wait, wait a second. I thought you said you were a cougar. 
<laughs> so I gave him the thumbs down. <laughs> yeah, so I don't usually say this out loud very often, but I did my undergrad at the UW, and I uh, actually affiliate myself with Washington State University in Pullman. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So you you were you were going you did the program at Washington State, but you were living in Seattle. Uh, and I they have a campus in Seattle, or no? So I just did my undergraduate training. So I got my bachelor's of science at, at UW, and then I did my uh, doctorate training over in uh, Pullman, Pullman and Spokane. Oh, okay. So two completely well, separate were, It wasn't at Seattle for all eight years. Exactly. Like you had planned, uh, like you were saying. Okay. I, I got yeah. That. Yeah. So it's just your prerequisites. You just do your first. They say you can do two years and then jump straight into the doctorate program, or you can do the bachelor's, which is the route I took, and then moved over to Pullman and Spokane for that. So. Plans changed dramatically uh, mm -hmm. over the four years. So, okay. uh, so we bought the house in '05. So before the recession, we bought it for 380. I think my parents they uh, put 20 percent down at the time. Um, so for them, it was a very substantial down payment. And they said, "Okay, son, you know, it looks like you have enough friends up in Seattle. Uh, you know, do you think they could be roommates with you, or how could we work that out?" And I said, "Let's give it a try. You know, it definitely beats paying you know a thousand bucks a month at the time in Seattle for um, you know an apartment, a studio, or whatever." So the first year uh, was kind of kind of tough, just trying to get the house ready to go, furniture, things like that. But then, you know, living with friends, it just made it so much easier, you know. Um, actually, Steven, your host of this uh, Realize Games <laughs> podcast, who was a very good roommate of mine back in the day, too. And, you know, we all live together with, you know, Dustin and Hui, who are very uh, good friends with me still uh, here. And um, it was from those experiences where I actually gained the knowledge and wisdom and understanding. I was like, this is a really good way to not have to pay for a living. And you know, uh. living as a college student, we were we were broke, man. I mean, my parents didn't have a whole lot to give us and you know, I was living off financial aid and all that. So starting from that baseline, it, it kind of gave me the ability to jump into where I am now. And I said, you know, I gra just graduated out of pharmacy school. I had about $200,000 in student loans. And um, I was working part-time as a pharmacy technician at Fred Meyer here in Vancouver. So I had a little bit of money uh, in my checking account. But the secret sauce is I've always um, gave back a certain amount of money for financial aid because uh, I didn't need to use it all. I mean, the government let's just lets you rain thousands and thousands of dollars. I could have literally pulled 300, 320, 350K easily, mm -hmm. um, but I returned a lot of that. So the very last semester of pharmacy school, I actually, instead of returning that amount, I think I saved an extra like $30,000 that last year. Okay. So that, I just thought to myself, there's no time that I'll have this just <clears throat> huge amount of money in my bank account. And you know, thinking about the future, what I need to do, I need to start gaining equity immediately. It's just something that my parents were like, oh, you know, you get out of school, make sure you buy a house, you know, mm -hmm. start making money in the house. But honestly, I just think they didn't want me to move back in the house with them. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you saved this thirty thousand dollars with student loan money. Uh, mm -hmm. What was the interest rate on that versus like you know using that money for a house? Was it like was it pretty high interest for that? That's a very good question, Stephen. So the student loan rate, uh, the federal rate now is six point eight percent. And you start accruing interest the minute you borrow it. So you just imagine your first year, you're already borrowing like you know forty, fifty thousand dollars. That's been gaining at six point eight percent interest. Get to your fourth year, that fifty thousand dollar principal, you know, with interest is just I can't even calculate it in my head is some astronomical number. Yeah. Well, so it made sense at the time to use that money, even though it was accruing interest at six point eight percent to buy a house. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, the house I bought, uh, it's in Vancouver. Um, I bought it at the time, it was about $400,000. <clears> and it was, I think a 6% interest rate is what I bought it at. And so my all-in costs were something like twenty seven, twenty eight thousand dollars $28,000 for the house. And I was renting each room for like 700 bucks a month, I think. And I had three roommates. So my mortgage was around 2800 with PMI interest, taxes, all that type of stuff. And I was paying, I think it was like net 600 bucks a month to live in this, you know, huge house, wow. which was really, really Super cool. Super smart. Yeah. Yeah. And so how did your parents, I mean, your parents, obviously they understood real estate. Like this is a, this is a great strategy to buy a home where your kid's going to college because like you said, you can fill it up and become the rentals. And theoretically they can even pay you as an employee, as the manager of the house and put into your uh, retirement account as well. I, I know some folks that have done that. What what prompted that? Like, did they just like they intuitively knew that it made sense um, instead of you paying for you to rent, or like how did how did they figure that part out? 
Yeah, so it was actually both my brother and I uh, that went up to Seattle together. Okay, and so there was two of you. Exactly. So for them, it was almost like a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, they wanted to keep our finances low, and man, back then we were literally living just you know very bare minimum. At and, the time. and did they keep it in their name, or did they put it in your name, or how did that work? Yep, yep. So it's always been in their name. Um, yeah, and even to this day, we still keep it under their name for them. Uh, oh, and so they've held on to it and kept it as a rental. Exactly. So wait, what, what did the, you say they, they bought it for in 2005? So 05. We, this is like by the university in Seattle? This is about a 20-minute bus ride. Two exits to, away. Two okay, exits two away from. Away. Yeah, yeah, Stephen knows exactly where yeah, that yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. He worked across the street at the Fred Meyer, which is really <laughs> awesome. It was very helpful with him very working convenient. there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we bought an 05 for around, uh, I think it was 380 as well, same price I bought my house for. And um, I don't know what the interest was, but I just remember in 08, when the recession hit, <laughs> yeah. the house, I remember looking it up on Zillow, and it went down to like 270. Sure. So my parents were like... They were panicking or are they... To a degree, yeah. They're okay. like, this is a horrible investment, son. Like, you know, we expected you to have less... You know, and once you finish uh, school and all that, we hope that, you know, this house had some equity for you, but it's actually gone down. And I'm like, well, I still got to live here. What are you going to do? Sell it and I have to find an apartment to live in? Right. And they're like, oh, well, you know, we have good roommates in there and they're, you know, kind of making the mortgage payments. Still payment, paying, so right? Yeah. Still paying. And then when I went to pharmacy school in 2009, um, I helped uh, manage it remotely. So okay. all these years, and actually to this day, I still manage so, it remotely. Oh, so you took over the management of it for your parents? Yep. 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 And now at this point, what's it worth? Oh my gosh, it's like nine fifty. It was a million last year or something like that. So, moral of the story is: as long as you can afford and pay for your mortgage, just write it out. I mean, we've seen the data since you know the nineteen sixties: CPI with inflation, uh, with the rents and everything. You name it. I mean, house appreciation is always moving up, and the same with rents as well. Nice. And so it seems like you've taken that experience of you know renting out rooms there, brought it to your first purchase. Talk to us about how you are managing. It seems like kind of hard to manage, you know, multiple roommates in a room. How, do, how does that work for you doing that remotely versus like, an, you know, everyone thinks about like just renting a single family as a single family. So it's uh, really awesome. So I, I kind of use that Seattle house as like the granddaddy for all house hacks, right? So before house hacking was a thing, we kind of just had this just as, you know, a bunch of friends living together. Right. But doing it remotely is actually much less work and much less headache than actually dealing with it here. So mm. I have a single family in Hillsboro, uh, and that's about an hour drive versus going to Seattle. It's about two and a half, three hours. And I'm way more inclined to go to Hillsboro and fix something than I am just to simply call a contractor or a plumber or, you know, my American Home Shield warranty and just get it taken care of right then and there. Especially now, you know, when the cash flow is really, really nice, I don't have to deal with going up there. Um, my dad and I, we do spend, um, you know, father and son time together and we'll spend a day uh, just to drive up to Seattle, sit in the car, have nice talks. And he loves gardening. That's all he does now. He's, he takes care of his two nieces or two granddaughters and gardening. That's, that's his life. And I love it, you know? So, um, yeah, it's really cool to be able to, to deal with that remotely. And kind of the system I have behind that is I have one house lead. Usually he's in the master or whatever. Okay. And they deal with, um, I'll, you know, I'll post the ad on Craigslist or Facebook mm -hmm. is kind of the two mediums that I like to use. And then, um, I'll kind of pre-screen the tenant. And if they're qualified with a credit and background check, I'll give it to them to set up an appointment. And then they kind of gave me the thumbs up or thumbs down whether or not they're a good candidate for the home. Okay. And, and, and so they do they get like discounted rent or they just get the primary be bedroom or what, how does that work? So for whoever's available to do a showing, I throw them 10, 15 bucks and say thanks oh, for your you time. Oh, you just pay them per showing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. They're already there and they're already agreeing to the person. Yeah. So it's like, it's not me that's like, dude, it was my bad for picking a bad tenant. It's right, your right. guys' is bad for picking the wrong roommate. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll say this. I remember when I moved into Joe's house, I don't think I ever signed a lease, but I, I know you're a lot more organized now. How many leases are you managing? So at this point, we have about 16 or 18 leases between all the properties. Um, and it's been, it's been great. It's been absolutely great. I feel like it's much less work than dealing with a single family. Uh, I know like the property that we have, Stephen and I share in Hillsborough, the multifamily, that's been... Um, about four to five times more work with screening qualified tenants versus finding roommates that are just looking for a room. 
so much more qualified. Mm. Um, the roommates do all the work. It's just, it's seamless. To me. So this is mm. your typical, and your typical client is just like a college student or, you know, under or a graduate student or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Super safe, affordable housing, and they're all welcomed by the community. So usually it's somebody doing like an internship. So they're trying to make new friends and it just works out really, really well for them. Okay. Okay. And then, so did you, are you doing the same thing with that first house that you bought in Vancouver then or? So I've been doing that for about 10 years. And then uh, as of last year, um, I got married in September 2022 uh, to my wife, Nana, who's from Seattle. And um, at that point, we're trying to figure out what's the best pivot point for us because I love roommates. I've always loved the bachelor life. Um, it's been absolutely phenomenal. But at this point, when it's time to settle down and have kids, I need to um, we're working together to build a system on how to pivot out of that. And oh, okay. Okay. Else. Yeah. Oh, because it's in your still in the house that you live in. Correct. Oh, I see. I see. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and it's huge. It's crazy because it's a it's a five bed with an office, thirty five hundred square foot home, and I'm like, babe, do you just you just want it to be us to live in this house with our dog? Like, what's the plan? Because <laughs> she she says she doesn't want kids, but slowly, you know, things things will happen. But it's uh, it's I think it's way too big for for what we need right now. I mean, I need that much space. So, mm. so what's the game plan with that when you plan on just renting? It's a nice house. I mean, are you planning on renting that out fully, room by the room, and getting something more modest? Oh man, that's that's still in the the cards. I I, I don't know what the best move to make right now. Um, Nana, she loves that house. Um, we you know grew close together in that home, and uh, it's it's great. I mean, our mortgage on it since we bought it ten years ago is only twenty two, twenty three hundred. So mm -hmm. we were trying to find something uh, in East Vancouver closer to uh, mom and dad and uh, brother. Uh, but uh, the mortgage payments right now uh, it's about four thousand to five thousand per month. So it doesn't make sense at that, this point. So that's the hardest part about um, I feel like investing and, and moving around your primary is when you get to a certain age and certain life, you know, position. It's it's really hard to like downgrade your house or, or you know or like you know keep keep moving into things with roommates that type of thing. So, but. I think you'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just take some time. And, uh, I, you know, I love the fact that, you know, I have a very loving and supportive wife who allows me to think crazy and think outside the box, and she deals with it. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, she definitely deals with it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd like to jump over to kind of like our partnership. And as mentioned, I met Joe uh, when I was 18 years old, like a freshman at UW. I remember... Uh, him driving up to my Craigslist dorm. ad, or how did that no, work? No, no, we were, we were we had mutual friends, and oh, okay. uh, I met him. He drove up to my dorm, and that's how I met him. And you know, I made the silly mistake of moving out of uh, my dorm after the first quarter, and you know, blindly agreeing to live at uh, another friend's house in South Seattle. And when I went there, I absolutely hated it. Like I, I was, I was going to cry. Yeah, because I already I already paid the dorm to move out and everything, uh -huh. and yeah. moved all my stuff out, and I brought all my stuff to this this house that. Um, it definitely was not to my cleanliness standard. Let's mm. just say that. And mm. uh, I called Joe and I was like, "Hey, Joe, do you have a space for me? You know, because we'd become good friends in that first first quarter. Hung out a couple times. I've been to this house, and he made a little alcove for me. Like he literally, what was it like an office or a den? Yeah, it was the downstairs area where we originally planned to just make it like you know have two desks where I could study. And we moved the desk out, and it was like. I think it was smaller than a 10 by 10 space. It was like maybe a, like an eight by nine or something. Yeah, I mean, I had a twin bed, it was fine. Yeah, there was no door on it. So he literally had a shower curtain rod to close, <laughs> yeah, to kind of have some privacy. And then the switch was on the outside hallway so people would mess with him and turn it off the lights all the time. <laughs> or I'd wake up uh, and, you know, at the time I was dating Melissa, I'd wake up and you guys would just be right in front of me staring at me. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was a fun house, we had a really good time. It was an awesome time. How many of you guys were there? Uh, it was a full house. So like five, five, five of us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. It was five of us. Five guys. So. Lived together for, for some time. Those are the best times of college for sure. Yeah. And I think I was one of your first, uh, well, I came back to your house and I was one of your first tenants after you'd left. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was actually a pretty good experience. I think that was, I think you made, uh, your ex basically the, uh, the house manager at the time. And, yep. you know, I think finding the right personalities is really important in this room by the room situation. And so you, so j at the beginning you went more for friends, right? You went more for people that you could know and trust. And then afterwards you kind of went to the, the Craigslist and Facebook messenger thing. Did you ever have any trouble with like friendships be that like didn't work out or personalities that didn't work out in the house and you kind of like had to end a friendship that way or? It's, uh, oh man, when, you, when you're friends with somebody, that's, 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 that's like 
perfect. And then the minute they come live with you, you literally just opened up all the skeletons in the closet. It's it's crazy. Some of the habits, some of the things that you experience and, and, and learn about somebody. But overall, it's just the drop in, a, in the bucket, right? So you learn a lot about people, you learn to tolerate people. And as long as you have the tolerance level to, to uh, be open and understanding of each other's mm. differences, then uh, this system will work for, for most people. I mean, when you're just getting out of school, like you know, me having $200,000 in student loan debt, this was a great way for me to you know, get my first investment. And I had a huge tolerance for you know, different people with different personality types and whatnot. But yeah, with a wife who's not so tolerant, you got to kind of fine tune the system a little bit more, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, no, and I mean, you know, I had a great experience there. Joe is a great house manager and, you know, we kept in touch lately over the last, the 10 years after that. And when I did finally move back to Portland and, you know, we found out that we had a mutual interest in real estate. So mm. that's how we got moved. That's how we, you know, started searching for a property ourselves. And uh, let's just jump into partnership. Obviously, you know, I'm one of your first partners in terms of, uh, you know, getting into real estate investing. You know, uh, why did you decide to go that route? So I learned a lot about myself. I learned that it's very hard for me to make um, big decisions uh, by myself. So every home I've bought so far has been with the help of somebody else, believe mm -hmm. it or not. The first home with my parents, the single family home in Hillsboro because of Nana. And then um, this one with Steven and the next one with another partner that's uh, dear and close to me as well. And, um, you know, being in the pharmacy realm for all these years, I base my clinical decisions off of very black and white studies, right? Clinical right. studies, absolute power, something that's statistically significant. So that's why I can suggest a certain regimen to a doctor and say, okay, due to this study. There is no blueprint for real estate whatsoever. You know, I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of deals and I've always said to myself, is this really the best deal for me? Right. But when you have somebody like Steven that can jump in and said, you know what, this is going to be the deal. Let's jump on it. I literally found the deal at six in the morning and I said, oh, this is our cash flow, whatever. 650, it was a four, four unit, uh, three bed, one single bath, like I think a thousand square feet each unit. And I knew it was kind of a fixer. Send it to Steven at like 630. I said, Steven, what do you think? Offer on it. And I was like, what? 50,000 over, I said. 50,000 over. We didn't even see this property. We literally just wrote the offer, 50K above asking. And the listing agent was like, are you guys serious? Like, you don't even want to check this out? And they're like, I guess not. I mean, we can't until you get into a contract, so. Exactly, exactly. And to this day, this has been the best business decision I've ever made. So I've learned a lot from Steven. You, you kind of have to shoot at the hip. You know, you want to have a baseline set of goals and numbers and criteria. But once you have that number, analysis paralysis is real, especially for a guy like me who just kind of just sits there and waits until it finds the best sweet spot. You can't do that. And if, if I did, I know I would have lost this deal and we would miss out on so much equity. Yeah, I, I don't think I was in real estate yet. I wasn't an agent yet, but I knew that I wanted to move quickly. And my math, the math on this was really easy. I didn't even care about the rents or anything. I bought my... Uh, my fourplex in Vancouver, eight bedrooms, four bathrooms for 675. So when I, when I saw 12 bedrooms for 650, I was like, you can't really go wrong. Right. You know, I mean, and what's the worst that's going to happen? You have to repair the foundation or something? <laughs> I, mean, that's that's all I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> we actually had raw sewage dumping into the crawl space. Oh, boy. That's, that's how bad it was. But I mean, what's a, you know, literally, if you can fix it with money, it's not a stress, it's not a headache. You literally just sign a check and you get it done and it's have a nice day. I mean, we did we more had... than fix it with money. We, we went in and, you know, there were some clashing points for sure. But I think we learned a lot about each other and I learned a lot about myself during that process. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, like I said, every time you opened up a wall and you found even more things wrong, like it, it was really painful. Yeah, it yeah. was rough. It was rough. Uh, how, how do you guys manage the partnership in terms of like, work that needs to be done like let's say you need to renovate a unit are you guys just both doing all the stuff or is it like one person does one type of task one person does the other type of task how does how does that go well I'll, I'll just jump in saying that we were both learning at the same time like we had both owned our own properties had different styles of how we did things mm -hmm. you know i used to think i was a very hands-on person i learned from that experience that i don't like it as much as I used to, <laughs> you That's know, true. and you kind of learn a balance of what people are good at. I think, you know, like expect, like, I think in terms of our partnership and we're still great friends to this day, we did, like I said, have some pain points in terms of learning about our working styles and, and expectations, what we're good at. Yeah, yeah. And expectations and, you know, having some very frank and direct conversations really helped us get to a, a good balance point mm. and got to a point where we were just like, let's just pay someone to do a lot of this because it, it was, it was really hard. So you kind of started trying to do everything yourselves and then eventually you got to a point where like this is too much or 
like I said, every time we pulled open a wall, there were you know, cockroaches or a broken pipe or Black we had mold. to replace a roof or, you know, galvanized plumbing was leaking or, yeah, just all this crazy stuff that, like, I guess, like, mm, maybe this is why this house, this uh, property was so cheap. But honestly, right. I, I definitely still think this was one of my best, in, uh, one of our best investments ever. 100%. You know, like I said, it was a great learning experience. Yeah, a lot of hurt feelings here and there. But once we got through it, you know, we figured out a good working environment in terms of, uh, you know, I, I'm the hands on person. Like, I'll go in, I'll fix things, and I'll deal with things when needed. And luckily, we fixed a lot of things, so I don't get too many calls. And Joe's a really great people manager. Mm. So he takes care of all the lease up and all the contracts and that mm -hmm. type of stuff and finding new tenants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's been our balance so far. And we renovated three out of the four units, and we at some point we'll have that fourth one coming up, and I'm pretty sure we're just going to pay for someone to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you really have to have a knack for just jumping in and, and, and doing it. I mean, last year, 2022, when we did all of the remodeling, you know, I was still working full-time as a pharmacist, planning a wedding, still playing realtor, and then, you know, I remember waking up at like 4 in the morning, driving out to Hillsboro, you know, putting, you know, protective covering all of our appliances, driving back to the pharmacy and going to work, finishing up that shift at six and then driving back to Hillsboro, working until 12, you know, just trying to get things done so that the next day I could plan the wedding with my wife, um, Nana. So it's, it was a really, really crazy time, but yeah. you know, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about Steven and you know, that's part of the reason why he's such a close friend of mine is because I know that he understands all the avenues that I'm working on. He's like, Joe, let's just jump in there. Let's get it done. Let's get, let's finish this up together. So that way we can have a, an awesome wedding. So. And did you guys set up any sort of legal agreement on paper or did you just have kind of a, an understanding between the two of you? I mean, just understanding between the two of us. I mean, the property is tenants in common. You're, oh, yeah. You're, yeah. So you're both on the loan and you're yeah. both on title. So yeah. you have that agreement. Um, like I said, it's just one of those things, too. Like, I didn't want to overly plan it. I trust Joe. I still trust Joe. And we just kind of jumped in. Like I said, we learned a lot about each other. Um, and, I mean, it's turned into a very fruitful, very profitable uh, property for us. We can run the numbers if you want. When we started, uh, we bought at 675, uh, put 25% in. I think it was cash flowing like $1,000 a month for us at that point. Immediately, each. right? When you Immediately, When yeah. you bought it, 1000 each. Yeah, right. but I mean, we did put in, like I said, 25%. 25% down. So like $90,000 each, each out yeah. of pocket to start. And uh, then I had the fabulous idea of, hey, why don't we get three tenants out and spend at the time, my estimate was like thirty grand, and get these units fixed up. Uh, we end up spending a hundred grand. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely triple your budget and triple your time. <clears throat> Usually they say double, but with our property, oh my god! Every time we opened a wall, I was like, oh my god, there's another problem. Yeah, yeah, like and another. I think my down payment was like most of it was HELOC funds. Yeah. Oof, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was back when money was cheap, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My HELOC was like three point five four percent at yeah. the time. Yeah. yeah, and so we spent the hundred grand, and I mean that sounds like a lot. We put in ninety grand each. We spent another fifty grand each on top of that. Um, but I'd say it's worth it. I mean, right now we're cash flowing what like fifty six hundred a month. Fifty six hundred a month divided by two, so twenty twenty five hundred. Twenty three. Yeah. Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah. And how much is the property worth now? Man, it was a million at one point, and we started at six seven hundred. So 100K to build, I mean, that's, that's awesome, man. Yeah. That's Wait a second, so just some quick math. So you're making about 5,000 a month, did you say? Mm -hmm. So that's 60,000 a year. You put in total about one, two, almost 200. So you're gonna remake your costs in three years, more or less, give or take some. If three, that. Three, yeah. three, three and, and just how much equity is built. I mean, Plus, like I'm, yeah, I'm that's positive. not getting equity. The yeah. fact that we raised the rent from average of 1100 now to almost $2,000. It's 2100 $2, Yeah. Mm -hmm. to that, I mean, that brings up the value of the property drastically right. based right. on mm -hmm. the income approach of, of appraisal. And yeah, plus you've taken care of all the deferred maintenance. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It took six months every single morning, you know, look up deals and, and you know, you find the right one and you have a partner that's shooting at the hip. You just do it. <laughs> Literally, you don't think, just do, you know? Like it's I said, awesome. easy math. I mean, 12 bedrooms is better than eight bedrooms. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it wasn't like it was the middle of nowhere. It was Hillsboro. So, right. you know, I, close enough to Intel, close enough to Nike. Uh, I mean, we're definitely not getting that clientele, but you know, like it, it's in a, a busy area, blue collar for mm. sure. Um, like I said, I had a property in Vancouver and I, I think those markets, Hillsborough and Vancouver are, are pretty comparable. So I had no problem jumping in knowing right. that we would have to like, uh, you know, we would, we'd be dealing with some issues, but I know that we would definitely get our money's worth. So sweet deal. Yeah, that's great. I love you for it, Steven. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, you're a trained pharmacist. You still do work in that field a bit. 
What was the transition like of getting, I mean, well, first let's talk about working part-time as a realtor while you were um, in pharmacy. How did you balance that and, and what did that look like? To be frank, there was really no balance. <laughs> it was um, something typical. What's a typical week for you, pharmacy wise? Are you sixty hours, forty hours? What used to be sixty. Uh, there was a point when I was working eighty or hundred hours a week, just because of the you During know pandemic, labor shortage uh, and all that. Yeah. Um, oh well, before that we had oh, system conversions. That. Yeah, yeah. I think I was just trying to be an ultra aggressive and pay off my student loans. Um, so that's part of the reason why I had all the roommates initially in my house was to pay off the student loans. So I was twenty seven at the time when I graduated. I finished my last payment uh, actually the day before my 30th birthday. That was my goal. Oh. So I was ultra Holy aggressive. Cow. Didn't you say you had like 200 or something? 200K. Yeah. Yeah. I was Holy ultra shit. aggressive. I had, you know, like I said, you know, five roommates. <laughs> I rented my office, uh, you know, glass French doors. We threw bed, bed sheets over it just to cover, give them some privacy. So that covered my mortgage for the whole period of time. And I was just working at the pharmacy, whatever hours I could accumulate and get paid off. Cause you know, my parents told me, you know, that's bad debt. Get rid of it as quick as you can. So, you know, fast forward now to uh, 2022, 2020, 2023, I was working yeah, full time as a pharmacist. Usually I try and stick around 40, 45 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, people kind of catch on to your story. You know, <coughs> I, I like to cater towards most of the healthcare professionals, dentists, yeah. optometrists, because um, they hear my story and say, Joe, I want to do what you're doing too. So they know I still work, you know, full time pharmacy, but I never let that hinder me. You know, even working at the pharmacy, I didn't work at your typical Walgreens or Fred Meyer. You know, I have a desk, you know, I can I have a chair I can sit in, I can analyze deals and, you know, work on pharmacy stuff at the same time, which is really cool. So I never really miss a beat. Um, you know, after work, I go do some showings or before work, mm -hmm. I show some homes. But it was and, but, but you got you first got your license, though, like for your own deals or because someone was like, hey, I want to do what you do. Or how, how did you decide to get licensed? though? Yeah, it was initially just to get access to the MLS. Oh, okay, uh, so you could search for deals. Exactly, and then to look back at it, would I get my real estate license again to search under our MLS? No, I'd find <laughs> myself a kick-ass realtor like Steven to have him do the work for me, mm. and then I would just pay him for the deal. Like the money that you save, you know, in terms of you know the commission costs or whatever, they deserve that commission. You know, we deserve that commission because we're, we're literally doing the work for you or negotiating for you, and that is tremendous, tremendous value. Now being in the hot seat and vouching for your clients, I truly understand the value of how you're earning that commission. Uh, whereas before, you know, you just said, you know, I'm just gonna get that license, do it myself. Spend that time to really fine tune your blueprint and your criteria for finding those deals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I think. Okay, so you just got it at first to get the ML, to get access. Mm -hmm. But then when did you decide to actually start selling? Did you have, you had like a colleague come to you or how did that work? Were you, were you just like posting stuff on social media, talking about what you're doing? Like what, what, what was the transition there? Yeah, that's a good Cause question. Because yeah. you were like actually doing deals as a part-time realtor that like almost to the volume that a full-time realtor, I, I would say does. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, I haven't paid a dollar in advertising. And it's literally the power of, you know, word of mouth and social media. I mean, a lot of people follow my stories. And anytime I'm posting, like even a walkthrough for a house I'm looking at, you know, I'll get, you know, 20 messages on, Joe, where's this property? You know, what's what do you think the cash flow would be? Is this something that's good for me? And um, I said to myself, you know, I think my value in real estate is to help these health professionals, you know, they have the high income, but they have, you know, almost zero financial literacy. We've, we've been trained to prescribe and dispense medication, but when it comes to spending, there's just no literacy in schools taught about that. So I give them a little bit of, you know, what I've done and they're like, wow, this is incredible. You know, how can I get into this? And so most of my clients have been, you know, healthcare professionals in that avenue. Okay. Yeah. And then at what point were you like, I'm going to switch the scale and move from being a part-time realtor to a full-time realtor and a part-time pharmacist? It's, uh, for me, it was definitely a passion, right? So, you know, I definitely have a passion for helping others. From a healthcare standpoint, you know, we deal with a lot of hospice patients and to allow them to be comfortable or like, you know, I met my wife in a medical mission in Vietnam um, and... Uh, to be able to see the impact that you can make from a clinical standpoint, that's that's amazing. It truly is. Um, but then to also give back on a sense of you know where my parents came from. I mean, they're refugees from the war. I mean, I remember I still remember my pink lunch ticket. I had free lunch uh, going to school. To grow from that and to allow you might you know myself to share that knowledge with somebody else and pass that on to have that financial 
success as I do, I feel like that's a more powerful impression that I've had um, compared to doing pharmacy. So that's why I do what I do mm. now. Have you worked with a lot of people who took, took your model of uh, rent by the room? You know, actually, one of the clients was a referral from Stephen. Um, so he's not a healthcare professional, but uh, he was looking for a property in Vancouver. And um, he was really interested in what I was doing. We sat down and had lunch together. And he said, this is really, really cool. So, uh, yeah, now he's actually, I, I follow his Instagram. He was in Hawaii for like two months. Oh. And then uh, now he's in Japan. And uh, actually, Nan and I are going to go to Japan next month. And we plan to meet up with him over there. Um, so, you mean in Japan, like he lives there? No, he's just traveling the world right now. I literally call him Mr. National Geographic. He's living, living the millennial dream, huh? <laughs> he's living the millennial dream. He does uh, <laughs> coding. Yeah, software engineer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Software engineer. Just and, stay in uh, Airbnb, wherever, and have his house pay for his expenses or what? Yeah, so he was doing it for a little while, and then he had a mishap with his home. Um, he loves to work on cars, and his car battery actually exploded in his garage oh, and what? caught on fire. So um, he's getting some insurance money from that and, and whatnot, but he's, he's nonetheless, he's still doing okay to where he's enjoying life and, and, and doing all these things. So it's, it's, it's kind of a sad situation for him to go out that way, but you know, doing the roommate model did definitely help him a lot. And then if you're filing everything appropriately, then you know, insurance does reimburse you for that because you are running a business. And now for him to continue the life and, and living that life, it's, it's actually oh, pretty Oh, he was able to get loss of income as well as just the loss of the home. Yep. <clears throat> yep, yep, exactly. Yep. All right, how do I rig a car battery to explode? <laughs> <laughs> you got to talk to Qua for that one. <laughs> yeah, I just kidding, I didn't say that. It's not on the <laughs> That's funny. That's so, funny. yeah, I mean, if you were to uh, advise someone on getting started in real estate, what would you tell them? Yeah, so in today's time, it's definitely much more difficult. So, you know, you can fine tune your skills, write your blueprint or criteria all you want. But I feel like you really have to take the leap of faith and actually do it. You know, if you're going to spend all the time to to create that that blueprint next year, the market will, will change and that blueprint is no longer valid for today's time. Right. So what worked in 2022 is not going to work for 2023, just looking at the rates itself. So. I just say, you know, kind of from Top Gun 2, Rooster always said, you know, don't think, just do. Um, once you have that blueprint and it, you know, checks everything off your blueprint, just jump, just do it. And if, you know, you feel like you're kind of new at this and you kind of have wet feet or cold feet, have a partner that you can trust to work with you and have those skills. You know, for me, I love eating out. I love networking. So for me, finding people who are good at certain things um, it was kind of on my side. So I was very grateful to meet Steven. You know, now he's one of my close friends. You know, he was actually a groomsman to my wedding. Um, I met a lot of incredible people through Steven. And um, from that, I've just been able to build whatever we build today through the real estate. And I started just with, you know, a small group of friends that had the same passion for growth. And it, to me, it seems like the strategy of owning a primary and renting out rooms will just like always be viable. Mm -hmm. um, because it, you know, it worked for you back when you were in college. It worked for you after ten years later, after your college. You feel like today, it's it still would work though, even though mortgage payments are way higher. You can still significantly offset your mortgage payment, correct? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that, Jordan. Uh, and especially now, where ADUs, you can get them financed under a traditional uh, mortgage. You know, that that opens up more ability for you to potentially rent out that ADU and still have your sense of privacy. So if you're less tolerant of having roommates and you just want to have a separate quarters in the back where you can rent out completely, that's a huge way to offset that mortgage payment today. Yeah, and it can actually allow you to qualify for more um, mm -hmm. with that with that hypothetical income. So Exactly, yeah, yeah. It's a little more challenging today, but it's definitely still doable. I mean, it's still a great way to get started, especially with people who don't have a lot of money. Like you can use that primary loan, that's like what, 5%, even as low as 3.5% uh, for physicians, even as low as 0%, which I just did one of those deals to get started in, you know, owning an asset that's gonna, you get 100% of the growth on right. for how little you put <coughs> down for it, so. It's yeah, especially if you have three or four people helping you pay your mortgage. Yeah. Um, is there any, just because I think that strategy is interesting and we haven't talked about it a lot on the podcast, you mentioned something earlier about insurance and taxes that I, that might have, someone might have missed. What do you advise people to do <coughs> set up? Like, so you that income you're claiming on your tax returns, right, as like Schedule E income? Correct. Okay. Yeah. It, what else would you recommend to people that are doing that? Um, do you have leases for everyone in the house? Yes, I do. Yeah, lease for everybody in the house. Mm -hmm. So lease for everyone in the house, you put that income on their taxes. Any Anything else that's like important? 
Definitely uh, get educated. Um, it's really interesting. So every morning I walk my dog, and I'm usually listening to like you know your guys' podcasts, um, or I listen to a lot of audiobooks. So an audiobook I definitely recommend is Amanda Hans. Um, it's a it's a real estate book, but it's a you know you think of taxes as being really dry. She really states things in a way where it's like, did you know that you could claim this or claim this mm. or claim your car or all these things? And I'm like huh, this is really cool. And then, you know, I run it through my accountant and CPA and they're like, yeah, that would fly. That would totally fly. So everything I do can be considered a tax expense as long as, you know, it's under a certain code or guideline. But um, there's definitely ways and the government definitely incentivizes you to own real estate and provide housing to tenants. Mm. Definitely. Okay. Versus the W-2. Yeah. um, Figure out your taxes, figure out a little bit. Of, I mean, the nice thing too, I mean, landlord-tenant law in, in our state, maybe not as much in Washington, is pretty strict. Um, but a nice thing about that is that typically your primary home is a little bit less strict, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 Definitely. Uh, there's more things you can claim. So for a primary home, you just need to claim the square footage that uh, all the common spaces are being used. You don't have to, you don't have to claim like uh, your, your own space. So whatever space is in square footage, you just take a proportion of that and that can be tax expensed. So all the income that I'm making in my primary, it's all, it can all be written off. I would say this is, Joe is uh, one of the most organized people in terms of taxes I've ever met. I mean, he literally has an <laughs> app that tracks him uh, where he drives so he can write off all his miles. Everything, yep, yeah. every trip, yeah. Mm-hmm. Every, every time I go out to get a restaurant, you can write notes. Everything. And it's just the pharmacy side of me, right? So you kind of take strengths and dosages of medication and you apply it into this different realm. Yeah, I mean, I think that stuff, like, I always look at that on the taxes and I'm like, I didn't document any of that stuff. (laughs) So it's like, if you you have any way of easily documenting that, it's pretty important, right? Yeah, yeah, I love it. uh, QuickBooks or the self-employed app is definitely an app I recommend because it tracks just about everything. Yeah. And how much did that change when you went from being part-time pharmacy or to full-time real estate? Or were you working enough hours in real estate before that you could get all the self-employed exemption? So, yeah, believe it or not, in 2022, working an average of 40 hours a week as a pharmacist, I exceeded more hours in real estate than I did working uh, as my W-2. you document based on your amount of time searching or driving or whatever. Exactly, exactly. Working in construction, showing homes to clients, <clears throat> all the accounting, listening oh, yeah. to podcasts, all that time is accounted for. I want to get paid for listening to podcasts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I was going to say, I mean, you know, you qualify as a real estate professional in tax terms, so that saves right. you like That's huge. a ton of money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I, I don't qualify for that because of, you know, I'm a W-2 employee, so it's, I always look at that, I'm like, eh. <laughs> It's a big one, yeah. and, and the IRS definitely pulls a red flag on it, but I mean, I, you should see my calendar every single day I have hours. Right, you're not going to be scared if you've documented like that, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's definitely peace of mind, <laughs> but it's a lot of time for sure. But, you know, my, my wife and I take lots of trips everywhere, so every time on the plane, I'll pay the eight bucks for Wi-Fi. And my flight time, she's passed out and I'm literally like swiping left or swiping right on this as a business expense or personal expense. And that's how I manage it. Yeah. Love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the uh, one big thing that people miss out on in terms of real estate is all the, the savings and taxes that you get. Like they are, they're always looking at cash flow and equity. Well, how much can you write off in your property, you know? Yep. Yeah, that's it's tens stuff. of thousands of dollars that you're literally writing off that you can keep versus having to pay back to the government. Yeah, another avenue I always tell people to get into real estate. Like, there's so many things to make money on <laughs> or save money on, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yep. Well, Joe, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and sharing our, your knowledge with us. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, if someone wanted to, like, you know, follow you or, like, you know, reach out to you, it, is Instagram like a good place to find you? Yeah, so I'm usually pretty active on Instagram. Uh, my Instagram handle, uh, if it's still called a handle, I don't know, is uh, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, J Treezy, J A Y T R E E Z Y. Come find me for cool footage about uh, you know traveling, you know, hanging out with my dog, or you know, my typical slogan, "Yo, baby," when it comes to cheers <laughs> at a restaurant. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Joe. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Definitely, I'll be on the show. Yeah. Have a great day. Cheers, yo, baby. Ha, <laughs> ha,